as promised, ladies and gentlemen, we have with us today Nina Schick. And Nina, of course, is the author of a new book called Deep Fakes, which I warmly recommend. And uh, Nina, you've done an amazing job positioning yourself as an expert in this emerging, what we, I don't know, is it a threat? Is it an opportunity? Is it a nightmare? (laughs) That might be a good place for us to start. So tell us a little bit about the premise of your book. And I, I think an important thing you bring out in this book is this distinction between deep fakes and synthetic content. I think that's important for people to hear. So tell us a little bit about your book. Well, my background really is in information warfare and geopolitics. So when I saw this thing emerging, which really is going to be a paradigm change in not only the way we communicate, but also the way that humans perceive the world and perceive themselves. And I am talking about AI generated synthetic content, the ability for AI to manipulate or wholly create content that is fake, as in it's generated by AI, it can be a video, it can be a picture, it can be a piece of text, it can be a piece of audio. This is a nascent technology which has only been emerging for the last three years and it really is due to the revolution in deep learning over the past decade which has given, uh, that means that there's enough data and enough generative power of computers to go churn through that all. This means that AI is now getting to the point where it can actually generate synthetic media. This is going to be immensely valuable for a whole plethora of creative industries. Um, It's going to rewrite the future of everything from fashion to film to corporate communications. But because AI is actually going to democratize the ability for anyone to generate synthetic or fake content with no skill, Uh, and no money needed, it is also going to become a very, very powerful weapon of mis- and disinformation. Now, mis- and disinformation and visual manipulations have been around for many decades. Uh, uh, You know, the Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin, for example, was a great proponent of doctoring photographs uh, for visual disinformation. But what AI can do is far more sophisticated than anything we've seen in the past. And it's also going to be accessible to anyone. So whilst you're creating this paradigm change in the future of all content production and human communication, you're, which is going to be terrifically exciting, this technology is undoubtedly also going to be weaponized by bad and naive actors. Yeah, that's one of my <clears throat> sayings that I've, <clears throat> excuse me, I've written a lot about that where corruption can occur, corruption will occur, of course. And you you mentioned this amazing technology. One of the things that was so interesting in your book, and I'm going to get this all wrong because I'm not a technologist, but you said that, that the one of the fellows that like developed the face swapping technology actually like created two AI systems that competed against each other, trying to fool each other to get better and better and better. I mean, absolutely fascinating stuff. And the technology is, is, is magnificent. Now, as you said, you know, we talked about, you know, corruption and immediately that's what comes to mind here. And and that's pretty obvious uh, as you think through some of the implications, but, but, you know, as you study this, maybe like no one else, uh, what are some of the non-obvious things that you're seeing that it, maybe some un- unintended consequences that people should be aware of? So I would say, especially for anybody who's a marketing professional, the future is synthetic. Within, I have no doubt that within the next five to seven years, it's going to become increasingly evident that all content we engage with is going to be either wholly or partially generated by AI. And this is why I make this important distinction at the beginning of my book that the taxonomy around this field really hasn't been decided yet, but this is a technology like all other powerful technologies in the past. It's merely an amplifier of human intention. So just as there are going to be misuses, there are going to be many incredible applications. So the first thing to note is that I talk about synthetic media as AI generated fake content that is viable, commercially um, applicable, and deep fakes as its misuse as mis and disinformation. So when we talk about synthetic media, for example, 
I think we're increasingly going to see that uh, for content creators, the ability for even a YouTuber to have the same kind of effects that are only accessible now to Hollywood studios with multi-million dollar budgets and teams of special effects artists, it's going to mean that creativity is going to go through the roof. A lot of people who I speak to who are on the startup side when it comes to generating AI generated artificial media say you can't even imagine what the future is going to look like vis-a-vis -vis content production, creativity, uh, virtual worlds, targeted marketing. So I think the first thing to do is point out that one of the unexpected consequences of this, which is I think going to become clear pretty quickly, is that it's going to be a huge boon for creativity. Um, the second consequence, which is something that I focus on given my background in disinformation, is that it is going to pollute an already corrupt and broken information ecosystem. Because for the past kind of 10 years, we've already been dealing with this huge crisis of misinformation, which increasingly has taken the shape of visually manipulated media. And they're not even very sophisticated in many cases. Uh, but when AI generated fake media gets into this polluted information ecosystem, one of the things that it's going to do is the noise is going to get a lot busier and the ability for us as consumers to distinguish between truth and noise, what's authentic or not, is going to become increasingly difficult, especially because these AI generated fakes are going to be from a fidelity perspective, just like the genuine items. So it's going to get a lot more confusing this information ecosystem that we exist in. Yeah, you, something uh, just came to mind as you were explaining that, Nina, that um, I read an article that talked about how uh, we are increasingly polarized because we no longer have a shared reality. And uh, what I mean by that is, let's say, um, you know, 30, 40 years ago, the the shared reality more or less was created by the daily newspaper. In, mm. And in, in America, you had a couple of uh, uh, news networks that everybody kind of watched the same thing. There were certain standards for content, uh, certain uh, commenter, commentators and curators and reporters who were trusted and at least you had a shared reality for discussion and debate. And today it's so hard to even recognize what's true. And I think what you're pointing out here is it's gonna get worse by some magnitude. <laughs> Absolutely. This is already a trend that has been going on for a long while and has been accelerated in particular with the technology of the information age. The ability for anyone to kind of exist in a silo when it comes to receiving their information, forming their worldview, to the extent that even an objective reality becomes a purely subjective experience. You know, uh, we this is already common in culture when people talk about things like your truth or my truth. So the I think that there is an objective reality, but our ability to agree on what that is has become increasingly partisan. And I have no doubt that this trend will accelerate once there is a lot of synthetically generated media out there. Because one of the first consequences of synthetic media is perversely called... Um, the liar's dividend, because in order to protect ourselves from deep fakes or AI generated fakes, one of the first steps is inoculating the public. So telling them that this kind of high fidelity fake content exists. But even before the fake content becomes ubiquitous, one of the consequences of that is this phenomenon known as the liar's dividend. Because if people believe that anything can be faked, so seeing is no longer believing, um, then everything can also be denied and even authentic media can be decried as fake. So this nefarious process that you're talking about, the corrosion of what is reality, what is the objective truth, only becomes even more profound when we exist in a world where we learn that seeing is no longer believing and everything can be fake. So I think that is absolutely going to be accelerated once we have uh, many deep fakes in the information ecosystem. 
So what's what's holding this back right now? You mentioned you think this could be five to seven years. One expert in your book said it might be three to five. But some of the examples that you give in your book, which I looked up on the on on the internet and are quite compelling, I mean it's pretty darn good. <laughs> so yeah. what's 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 keeping this from really becoming prevalent in the next twelve to eighteen months? What 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 do you think? What are some of the hurdles that are going to have to be overcome to get people there in the next uh, three to five versus you know twelve to twenty four months? Yeah, I think the baseline is still the what I said at the top. The future is going to be synthetic. Experts kind of debate on how long that's going to be. Uh, but I think we'll definitely start seeing changes within the next three to five years. I'd just like to caveat that by saying this technology is so nascent still. It's only been about two and a half years since the first kind of uh, deep fake started emerging from the kind of cutting edge of AI research. So the fact that it has grabbed so much public attention means that there's sometimes been uh, a tendency to overstate how good deep fakes already are. You know, there's been a lot of kind of headlines written about deep fakes going to end democracy, et cetera, et cetera. But that is only because they are such an interesting topic. Um, we're not there yet because the barriers to entry are still quite high, but they're coming down rapidly. They're or this technology is already being wrapped up in very uh, accessible so, um, interfaces, like on apps, on smartphones. And I have no doubt that within, well, like the next five years, they'll be far more abundant. Um, there are many, many startups, a lot of investment focusing on the generative side of uh, getting AI, creating um, AI generated fakes. So I think that it's inevitable really that it's coming we can debate whether it's three years, five years, but it is coming very, very quickly. I can't actually even tell you where we're gonna be in 12 months, uh, let alone in three years. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. you, I think that the, for marketers, I, what really sort of gets me excited about this is is some of the opportunities. Mm. In my in my book, uh, Marketing Rebellion, I emphasize that in the consumer world of today, the customer is the marketer. They're the ones who are carrying our stories forward, and you know, passing this on to their audience. And so it's kind of exciting to think about what if our consumers are telling big stories. Hollywood level stories about their their experiences with our products and our services and our and our brands. So that's that's certainly exciting, certainly exciting. You can also sort of think about some of the uh, problems that could be that could come for marketers and business professionals uh, as maybe company content becomes um, held hostage by by some of the corrupt people out there. So from a marketing perspective, you know, what what would be a positive or a negative that you would be looking for uh, that we could discuss in our marketing uprising group? Well, f first, let's tackle the positive. Um, like I already mentioned, it's going to be a tremendous boon for creativity and content creation. Some of the earliest applications we've seen uh, of deep fakes um, or synthetic media in a positive kind of advertising uh in a scenario where it's been used for advertising was the State Farm ad, uh, which was basically promoting the Netflix documentary, The Last Dance on Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls in the 90s. And what they did was they took a piece of original ESPN arch archive footage uh, in which the sports reader was talking about, you know, Michael Jordan and the Bulls in the 90s. And they used AI to manipulate that original clip and made the newsreader say, and in 10 years, in 20 years time, they'll probably release a documentary about this on Netflix. And, you know, he basically made him a, a fortune teller on what was going to happen in 20 years time. That was a very, very clever advertisement. Um, it shows the tremendous potential of synthetic media to be used not only in an advertising um, capacity, but also for marketing. Can you imagine for your consumers, you can do personalized video content. I mean, this is wow. something that sounds as though it is in the realm of science fiction, but really it's 
probably within this next decade. Yeah. So being able to reach your consumers with personalized video content, um, things like the licensing of brands. So for mm -hmm. example, because AI is very good at generating the likeness of celebrities or any human, um, someone like Michael Jordan could, for instance, just license his brand and marketers could use his image to deliver personalized content to consumers. The, the possibilities are endless. Um, when it comes to the negative side, I think that more broadly, I would make the comment that in the corroding information ecosystem where disinformation and misinformation is replete, not only every politician, but every brand and every business is also going to become a potential uh is potentially going to be become a target, target of yeah. a disinformation campaign. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've already seen, for example, how famous news brands have been, you know, their logos have been taken and put into different contexts and videos, but this is increasingly going to become something that's true for the private sector as well. So every single brand needs to pr have a crisis plan, not only do social monitoring of what's going, what's go happening in the social media space, with regards to the information being shared about it, but also have a plan for crisis communications in the event of a disinformation attack, which may include synthetic media. Well, that really leads us into a, a, a huge question here, both for individuals and for and for organizations. You mentioned this really w wonderful idea about someone like Michael Jordan being able to license their image to be in all these wonderful uh, creative new uh, types of content and I personally am looking forward to the next Charlie Chaplin movie that will be coming out of this I think there's lots of amazing opportunities but uh, just as you could license this in a legal way and use this for positive entertainment purposes one of the things that was quite moving to me about your book is the examples you provided of celebrities whose images are being abused in horrible ways. And and I think it was Scarlett Johansson who who just said, look, you know, this is, it's impossible. There's nothing you can do. And my heart just sank think, thinking, you know, uh, you know, here's a, a famous person, but yet an innocent person who doesn't deserve this sort of abuse. And this could happen to anybody. Anybody, if someone has a grudge against you, this sort of thing could be used. And I, I, my favorite part of your book, Nina, was the last part where you talk about some of the positive things that can be happening to protect us. And I hope your next book is blowing out that chapter because that's what we really need to start working on is, is supporting you and other voices in this field to raise awareness and do something, you know, positive, hopefully even aggressive about this. So what are some of the things that you're encouraged by that, that could, you know, help us focus more on the positives, the wonderful creative opportunities, rather than the, than the corruption? What are, what are some of the things that uh, we can be looking forward to in the next couple of years that are hopeful? Well, the good news is that there are many groups and organizations and individuals already working in this space of trying to shore up the information ecosystem. Uh, I think that the first kind of step is conceptualizing the problem. How is, you know, Russian interference related to fake news, related to AI generated synthetic media, related to, um, you know, a failed coup in Gabon? And I say all of that exists within the wrapper of this kind of corroding information ecosystem. So once we understand that, it's very it's easier then to talk about how do we fix the problem. And broadly, that falls into two categories. There's a lot of technical solutions we can use. So, for example, putting into every touch point into this ecosystem, the technology that will detect fakes, as well as the technology that embedded in your devices that will prove the provenance of authentic media. It's increasingly going to become important for brands who want to show that a piece of media is authentic to almost watermark it from its inception mm -hmm. to show that it's not a fake. But then secondly, you have to talk about building society-wide resilience. And that is really a, a, a broad category because it relates to policy, it relates to regulation, it relates to to 
a networked approach between um, synthetic media creators, policymakers, the big tech companies. This is not something, like I said at the onset, because it's this huge paradigm change in the way that we communicate. It's not something that one strata or one part of society can tackle by itself. And I think that because it's so nascent, we still have this opportunity to formulate how synthetic media can be used positively whilst mitigate, mitigating against its worst use cases, because this technology is incredibly exciting in many ways. And uh, it's imperative on us not to throw out the baby with the bathwater and say it's all bad. So hopefully we can mitigate against some of the worst uses and then um, capitalize on the incredible gains. Well, I think you've probably fired a lot of people up today, Nina, and that's what we wanted to do. Um, <clears throat> so other than uh, buy your book, what can an individual do? to learn more about this, to really support you in your activism and take an individual responsibility uh, on what might be happening in our future. So after we've kind of understood, I think, the conceptual threat, I think that is the first step. With knowledge comes power. And I really think that this is something that is almost going to have to be a society-led gra grassroots effort to try and correct the course when it comes to our corroding information ecosystem. The second thing I would say to all individuals is be critical, but not cynical. Um, because I think that if you become cynical and just believe everything is fake and every, you know, then, then we've kind of lost the plot a little bit critical without becoming cynical. And of course, be vigilant. Understand that there are new ways in which your identity can be hijacked, your biometrics can be emulated by artificial intelligence and be used against you in the most heinous ways without your consent, without your knowledge just from a digital footprint that you, almost everybody will have online. Almost everybody will have some photos or some audio or some video of themselves online. So be vigilant. Mm -hmm. And when these solutions come out, which is going to happen fairly soon in terms of protecting yourself with detection tools and provenance tools, be sure to implement them. It's just like installing the antivirus on your computer this is you know the next threat coming down the line so be vigilant and make sure you protect yourself against it yeah sounds like there's a business opportunity there too really i okay. mean you know it's almost like an insurance policy <laughs> absolutely. absolutely yeah nina schick thank you so much congratulations on your success and best wishes to you and keep fighting the good fight for all of us thank you mark all right. Thanks, Nina.